Welcome to this week's Monday meeting. Today is April 5th, 2021. Monday meetings are a chance for motion designers all over the world to connect and ask questions, share inspiration, or hear presentations and interact with industry leading artists on an equal playing field. Your host is myself, Liam Clisham, but we've got the whole gang here and we're with our guest, Mark Lawrence, and we're gonna talk about how he utilizes LinkedIn to get motion design work. Um, so hopefully it will be a great conversation. It's also the day after Easter, so we'll see how it goes with participation, um, but we've got some people here already. First off, Mark, thanks for joining. Um, I did mute you at the beginning, so you probably have to unmute yourself again, but um, yeah, Mark was on the Motion Hatch podcast a few weeks back. I heard it, and I was really inspired, so I asked Mark if he wanted to come on, so here he is. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm humbled to be um, to be asked on. And um, you know, I said at the end of that podcast, just just get in touch if 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 you're in the same sort of situation as I am, just get in touch. The best thing you can do is just reach out. Um, I've been on LinkedIn now for well, actively for about eight months, seven eight months, and uh, I use it to reach out to people, not just most other motion designers, but potential clients, other service providers that I can see are doing really, really well on LinkedIn. Um, and it not only does it help with like your network, the networking, but it gives you more confidence as well. And one thing I'll say is that people don't hold back on giving you advice and support and guidance, no matter where they are, no, no matter what industry they're in. So it's, it's a brilliant platform. Yeah. And so we've talked about it a little bit on here, and I feel like until the last year or so, I kind of had very little interest in using LinkedIn, but for some reason, maybe it's just the pandemic, it feels like becoming a lot more popular. And George has talked about it too, that he finds most of his clients through LinkedIn. So I guess, could you talk about like why you've made that your platform of choice versus where like, most other motion designers are posting dailies on Instagram and things like that. Um, so what, what do you find most helpful about it and what, why did you choose it? Well, I, I started posting regularly on Instagram and I thought um, Instagram would be my platform because I could see other motion designers doing really, really well there. Um, just if I sort of fill in a bit of my backstory, I left full-time employment exactly a year ago. Um, it was a redundancy situation uh, and I thought, if I don't take this opportunity now, then I'll end up dying on public transport, which is not what I want to do. I don't want to die um, as a manager in corporate, although it's a very good place to be. Um, so I left knowing exactly what I wanted to do, but I had no clue as to how to go about doing it. I didn't know how to see myself as a business owner. Um, so I just started posting what I thought would be really good um, promos, if you like, about what I offer on Instagram. And the more you post, the more traction you get generally, but I wasn't really getting that much biting. Um, and it was only when I turned to LinkedIn that I found that I could make real relationships with not only other motion designers, but um, potential clients as well, real face-to-face -face relationships. Um, and there was a, to me, there was a difference between the way uh, you can relate to someone on Instagram as opposed to LinkedIn. And I, I'm, I really value that kind of the face-to-face, -face, although obviously that's, we can forget about that real face-to-face -face for the last sort of 12 months, but I really value those sort of human connections. And I got more out of that from LinkedIn when I sort of transitioned from Instagram to LinkedIn. Um, so I thought this is where I want to be. And that's where I started reaching out to people. Um, early on in LinkedIn and because of the volume of guidance and support that was offered I thought this is it I found I found my place regardless of whether I was getting any clients at that point because I wasn't it's because I was getting so much advice and support just from DMing other like graphic designers as one PowerPoint designer even illustrators copywriters you know, other service providers that I could see were doing really, really well because of their content and because of the engagement. Um, I just wanted to know 
how they were doing it. Uh, so reaching out, just saying, look, do you have 30 minutes spare in the foreseeable just to sort of have a quick chat? Uh, and I was shocked. Everyone said yes by one person. Everyone by one person that I've reached out. And I still reach out now. And I will never stop reaching out because I don't think you should. I think you should always network. Um, so it was, you know, that was the, the light bulb for me. It was a real human thing that I got from LinkedIn that I didn't from Instagram. In Instagram for me is brilliant for showing off what you do to attract people. Uh, and you can do that on LinkedIn. But for me, LinkedIn has that additional human element to it, which I really value. Um, other, other motion designers might have different experiences, but that's, that's where I fell on my feet, I think, when I realized that there was that human element to it. Do you find, like, by human element that they're just, just, they're just more genuine about, like, how they're commenting and interacting with you versus the other platforms? But there is an element of that, I think. Um, there are some technical things that are very different from Instagram. You can, you know, on Instagram, you've got 30 hashtags. On LinkedIn, if you use any more than nine, then the algorithm gets very grumpy with you. Uh, so you've got to make sure you stay within the, these sort of guidelines because it will penalize your post quite easily. Uh, and that's, I found that through learning, um, trial and error really. But um, yeah, I, th I, th I think so. I think you get more support from from people that are not in your niche. Even someone that, even from business owners that know they don't want to do business with you because you're not, you don't offer what they need. They'll still comment on. I find they still comment on your post and say, you know, I really like this about it. You could have added this or that. You know, um, why didn't you do this out of curiosity? That sort of thing. That's just my experience um, on Instagram. Maybe if I'd spent longer on it, I may have got a similar kind of connection. But um, I think the fact that my first sort of human, real human connection, uh, and those sort of real authentic responses came from LinkedIn. That's why I kind of headed over the, over, headed over to that side. Now you were talking about real briefly, um, that even people that aren't interested in using your services are still interacting with you. Um, and that's really interesting to me too, because with normal networking, it's all about word of mouth. And it seems like, wow, if you can even get people that aren't interested in using your services talking to you about things, that's gotta drive engagement for those clients that are interested in those services. So um, I guess, how do you go about facilitating that like what what kind of content are you putting out that is engaging both parties ones that aren't going to use your services and, and ones yeah. that are going to yeah it's a mix you, you do a mix and i've only realized that through trial and error over time um you know you, you hit the nail on the head linkedin for me the differentiator is that it's a networking platform as well people don't mind if you reach out as long as you're connected people don't mind if you reach out just for a chat um, and I think that's the differentiator between that and, and Instagram. In terms of content, uh, I, when I first came on to both Instagram and LinkedIn, I was posting very dry corporate content about what I offer and what I know, how I know to sell with motion graphics on social. I spent all my life in corporate and I was institutionalized, totally institutionalized. So when I came out of that bubble, and it was a, it is a corporate bubble, if you've been there in real life, and you come out of it, you just think, holy crap, this is real life. <laughs> this is how it's done. So I was, I was writing posts in a very sort of corporate manner and getting tumbleweeds. Um, and I think that was the kind of initiator for me to sort of reach out originally to see how people were doing it. So the content over time sort of changes and my writing style changes as well, because I know I've dropped the corporate. I remember one of the guys I reached out to, he, he's a PowerPoint designer and he's, he's got a massive network. And he writes as if 
he was talking in a pub. He writes in that same style. Um, and when he told me that, I was like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. And he actually asked me, he said, send me your next post, I'll rewrite it for you, and then you can post it. So <laughs> he rewrote it, sent it back to me. He said, right, you need to, you need to post it now before 9 a.m. And I'm like, I can't post this. Every other word was F this and F that. <laughs> I'm not posting this. He said, yeah, yeah, but you've got to be authentic. You've got to be authentic. I said, I know that. I get that completely now. I'm at that point where I've dropped, I'm dropping the corporate stuff. And I'm, I'm understanding my own voice, but it's not me to, to swear all the time. I mean, I might drop a shit or a piss in every now and then, but I'm not, I don't drop the F form in any copy that I write. Um, so I rewrote it. I took all the swear words out, posted it. He wasn't happy that I'd rewrote his own his, his stuff, even though it was from mine anyway. Posted it, uh, and it got the big, the most engagement I'd ever got at that point. I think I had a network at the time of less than a thousand people, which is tiny, and it got about three and a half, four thousand views. Which is which was huge for a network of that of that of that size, and that was really the light bulb moment where I thought, well, I, I can't really start. I can't continue writing as if I'm still in corporate, like I'm writing an email to my team, because no one it doesn't resonate with anyone. The whole thing about writing like you're talking in a pub, or in a bar or whatever with your mates was was the door that opened for me that I thought, okay, this is how it's done. Um, you know, if you, if you, if a post landed on your feed that was very dry and corporate, you just flicked past it straight away, as I would, as everyone did with my early posts. So that, that's the first thing that changed my posting, the kind of style of my copy. Um, and I'm not a copywriter, but I've learned from some really, really interesting copywriters on LinkedIn as well. Um, in terms of the content, I've learned to vary it because every post was a sales post. This is what I do. Aren't I amazing? Buy my stuff. Your business will flourish with my stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Tumbleweeds. Doesn't, again, no one buys that kind of crap. Even if you're posting really, really cool animations. And I see loads of people on LinkedIn post amazing stuff. Just really, really, you know, School of Motion alumni. Um, you know, illustration, motion graphics, just incredible stuff. But all they'll say is, here's what I did for whoever the client was, and then post the video. Um, and that's that might be that might resonate with you and me, but for anyone outside of the motion design world, if they're looking for direct clients, that means nothing because the copy doesn't speak to them. You know, it's there's a backstory there about how that motion designer created that work over weeks and probably months. So that one minute video might have taken months to create. So let's talk to us about that, share that story with the video. That's the sort of thing that I now know people are really, really interested in behind the, behind, behind the scenes stuff. Like on Instagram stories, everyone loves doing behind the scenes quick. 10 second pieces to camera about what you're working on. It's really no different on LinkedIn. People love behind the scenes stuff. So I do a little bit behind the scenes. You know, I post some family stuff, maybe at weekends. Uh, Friday's always good for, let's have a bit of fun, a bit of a jokey post, try and get people laughing. I love Monty Python. I love Spike Milligan. So I'll try and weave in some, some of that some of that humor, some Vic Reeve stuff. Um, Mondays, no one really bites with sales posts on Mondays. Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays, talk about what you do. Talk about the outcome that you've had for your clients. Because those three days is when people bite, when prospects bite on those kind of things. And all this is stuff that I've learned over time. Yeah. Trial and error. Over sounds, seven months. I was going to say, it almost sounds a little bit like not not to downplay it but when an artist puts out an artist statement and they're just like 
writing as much BS as they can to like fluff up the work and just like the whole background and the story behind this piece. And like, yes, I, I worked on this for three weeks doing sketches and then we, it turned into this emotional development of things and kind of just like really making it sound more grandiose than it is just because it grabs attention better than just like, here's what I made and throwing it out there into the world. Yeah, but people are interested in that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, don't write an essay. You can't write an essay because you're limited to 1300 characters, but keep it, you can still keep it short and sweet. Talk about the challenges you came across, the technical challenges and how you overcame them. Who did you go to for um, support? You know, any learnings that you had along the way? All that's really, really, really interesting. Um, and people are drawn towards that kind of, those kind of stories. It's story, it's storytelling. Yeah. It's storytelling at the end of the day. You don't know it, but it is. Um, so I see we've got two questions. Augustine raised his hand and then Lucky had one in the chat. Um, Augustine, I want you to go ahead and then Lucky, you can read yours or I can read it for you. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question for you, Mark. Is like the people you target uh, on LinkedIn, are they like geographically located on the same country, region, or linguistics? The, the reason why I'm asking this is because I'm located in Belgium. And for example, if I want to network with people in my country, I mean, LinkedIn is way more corporate here, for example, uh, than it can be the UK or the US where it's way, way more broad. So for me, like, like, trying to like network through LinkedIn in the country is almost like I'm almost not targeting the right public because yeah. it's all like CEOs posting inspirational quotes of like, you know, an employee, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and you know, the, the, I mean, I don't, I don't write corporate. So the way I've been trying to network with these people is being myself, like you were saying, and more kind of like, you know, I'm, do jokes. I mean, I'm, I'm not jokes, but I mean, I like to do metaphors and stuff. And and I get replies, but they never got work from it. Uh, and on the other side of things, I heard like people, but mostly in the UK or the US, where LinkedIn is a completely different vibe. So, I mean, you know, how, how to network with those people from those sectors with those vibes when you're, you're not there, you know? That's really interesting. I hadn't really considered that it would have a different flavor per country. It's um, certainly in the US and the UK. The UK, um, I mean, I've seen LinkedIn change and I think lockdown has kind of helped the change towards a more informal style of, uh, of networking and of uh, creating content. And there's a bit of a joke. Some people say, oh, it's a little bit more like Facebook now. And I don't think that's a bad thing because I've had a LinkedIn profile for over 10 years. Uh, and I predominantly, when I was in corporate, I probably predominantly used it for um, recruitment into my team. Um, I, know, I never would have dreamt that I'd be creating the stuff I am on it now. If I was looked back 12 months, I'd be thinking, holy crap, what are you doing that for? You're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> but... Um, it's, I would say if you're looking at a potential clients in the UK and you want to be yourself, then that's the right way to be with the UK audience, certainly. Generally companies in the UK and even you know, entre entrepreneurs um, and limited companies and representatives of corporates and SMEs in the UK, they resonate more now with informal an informal way of copying of copy uh, but i have heard very similar things about the german um the way the germans use linkedin as well and i think there's there's a rival to linkedin in germany i can't remember what it's called but um that's quite interesting that you say that about belgium but i think certainly if you're looking at potential clients in the uk then be yourself take off don't make the mistake I did with the corporate rapper. Take that off. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I followed like a, like a masterclass from Google, let's call Google Rare. 
and um, it they they that it's part of the training also is like you know, find your icky guy and all that stuff and mm -hmm. and just like kind of express how you are and then people that will resonate with that will hire you and does that doesn't it's not a problem because anyway it wouldn't have gone like well because you wouldn't have like been a match in a sense. And uh, I do have like access to like the work that's happening in the UK. But the thing is like, even if like, like you said, like the pandemic has helped like the remote and everything, like most of the jobs, for example, in the UK require uh, being in the UK, even if you're remote, I don't know why. And on that sense, like clients in the US are way more kind of open-minded, I would say, mm -hmm. where like some of them might require for you to be in the same time zone, but others like just don't care. You know, like they mm -hmm. kind of like open their eyes to the pool of talent that they could find elsewhere and there's no coming back. I mean, <laughs> once you're there, it's like, you know, why should I like private myself from that, from this? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, for Belgium, it's really still like really corporate, really old fashioned, and I mean, it doesn't work at all. I mean, for me, of course. That's interesting. And I mean, for me, um, I, you know, I've had leads from all over, the, you know, from Australia, plenty from the US, um, most from the UK, but it's, it's the, the globe is your market, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Lucky, did you want to ask your question from the chat? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I never really add anyone on LinkedIn that's not a recruiter because back when you could, back when I was trying to find work uh, actively, it was like, you can't add anyone unless you know them personally, unless you have worked with them, unless you know, like you work by a company with them. So like, sure of lying, I really didn't really feel comfortable adding people because then it's like who are you has that changed in the last couple of years because this was years ago when i tried it and um because i have a lot more context than i've ever had but they're mostly rec recruiters i uh, just like I, I wonder if that's changed uh and how you go about like being able to add new people and the second question was going to be um like when you do posts on linkedin how often do they show up on your actual profile? So if you do have recruiters trying to find you and you have like, I don't know, like a bunch of sweaters and a bunch of like casual stuff on your profile, like, can that be seen? Or is it just kind of like, it only shows up in the feed? Uh, yeah, um, you can you can search for anyone on, on LinkedIn. So if you know the sort, if you're going for direct clients, um, you know the industry that you're looking at, you can search and you know the names of the companies, you can search the companies, you can then drill down and search the people who work in those companies, provided they're on LinkedIn. You can find those connections and request to connect. And if they accept that connection, then you're in. You, you are in, then they're part of your network. Whether you know them or not, it, it doesn't matter. That's how, that's what I do daily. I spend a short amount of time reaching out and connecting to people that uh, in sectors that I want to work in. In my case, it is uh, digital marketers working in the sustainability space and uh, MDs in SMEs. And it's taken me a while, a long time, I would say, to figure out who I need to be focused on. But once you know, then it becomes a lot easier. So you said you, you were... Um, looking at recruiters so that's great that's that's a target market so you look at them you, you know the companies they work the recruitment companies they work for you can search those companies search who the recruiters are and just connect uh, and recruiters will always nine times out of ten accept that request that connection request uh, and the worst thing that could happen is that they don't accept it and they'll stay in your pending folder and if someone stays pending for more than three weeks, I just delete that request um, and move on. But you can connect and connect and connect. It's, um, you know, it's like fishing. You find the right people you want to connect with, just hit connect. 
And if you pay for LinkedIn Premium, then that gives you an unlimited amount of connections that you can have. The, the free version of LinkedIn, you can connect with uh, a certain amount of people per day. I think it's probably about 30 a day, I think. But with LinkedIn Premium, you can have unlimited connections. It, it doesn't really give you a huge amount more for paying, paying for premium. Um, uh, is that okay? Is that kind of answer? Yeah, makes that sense. First part of the yeah. question. Cool. Um, and to answer your second part, when do posts show up on your profile? They show up on your profile straight away. Um, and in time, they get bumped down as you keep posting and keep posting. But you have a, a section on your profile called a featured section. Uh, and if you have a post that um, has performed really, really well with a ton of engagement, that is about how you help to change a company's fortune using animated video, motion graphics. There's an option on your profile when that post shows up in your profile, you can select the option to attach it to your featured section. So the first three posts in your featured section will show up as soon as somebody um, accesses your profile. So in my featured section, I've got a post where I proved what I did um, increase the revenue engagement of followers of a company that I worked for in September, I think. So I did a bunch of uh, Instagram animations. Uh, Instagram's brilliant for collecting data analytics. And over time, as that company owner kept posting those the animated video. Her engagement went up and she got more followers and she got more revenue compared to the same amount of time eight weeks before she started posting. So she sent me the graphs and the charts that Instagram offers. Um, and I used that as social proof to prove what I do um, actually increases revenue. And that post is on the first section of my profile of the featured section of my profile. So it can be a very, very powerful um, section of your profile, that featured section, if you use it properly. You know, some people have put really, really jokey posts up that get tons and tons of engagement, but are nothing to do with how they make money, with, with their skill set. And if you put something like that up on your featured section, that doesn't really say anything about you it just says oh this jokey post has got like tens of thousands of views but it doesn't say anything about how you change companies fortunes with motion graphics um, so yeah they, they show up straight away on your profile but the good ones you save to your featured section makes sense thank you um, I want to go in a little bit of backwards order. George, I saw your question in the chat. I'm going to get to Alex's first before we go into that. Is that cool with you, George? Um, so one thing that's kind of relating to this from Alex, she was saying, do you find that in-mail from recruiters tend to be valid opportunities? Every time she received a message from recruiters, they've been very mysterious and kind of void of detail. And she said that the generalized against any new opportunities for projects so um yeah i found that too like sometimes the end mail that i get is like it's very vague but uh it's it's kind of tempting to respond as well because it's like oh like maybe this is a job but it's also very easy for it to turn out to just be like kind of a spammy thing and somebody's trying to get into your network instead. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to connect. If you're interested in what they're asking you or offering you, you can always um, respond. You don't have to connect. You're in control of your network. You don't have to connect. You know, I've, I've never um, had any email from recruiters, I tend to get <laughs> spammed with Bitcoin entrepreneurs. Um, and when I do, I just uh, block them, unfollow them, 
disconnect them, which you know you're in complete control. So I wouldn't worry about being spammed because you can you can um, just block them straight away. In fact, it's, if they're real recruiters, it's, it's a nice problem to have if people are after you. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much you. for your response, Mark. I appreciate it. That's no problem. Alec, I would have let you ask the question. I thought you didn't have a mic because you were blacked out. <laughs> no, I do. I'm just also working, so it's very clicky over here if, oh, gotcha. if my mic is on. But thanks, y'all. Yeah. Um, before we go to you, Augustin, George should ask a question. George, you want to say it? Yeah, Mark, I was just wondering if you could just give us a bit more information about your, your life story. Like, what was your first job? What was your first real job? How did you get to where you are today before realizing that LinkedIn is the answer to all our prayers? Which, by the way, I'm in full agreement with. Like, what's your um, history? Oh, thanks for asking. My first job was a paper round. I used to get £2.85 a week for delivering papers up my street. It took about two hours, and I used to save up for computer games, which in my day were on cassette for my uh, ZX Spectrum Plus. Uh, and it used to take me about three weeks to save up for a decent computer game. And I remember when I got, uh, what's it, a Tick Attack, um, Jet Set Willy, uh, and Ghosts and Goblins on the ZX Spectrum. And I was always, always jealous of my friend's Commodore 64s because they had better graphics. There was this, it was almost like the PC Mac thing, the ZX Spectrum Commodore thing. Same, same vibe. So, that was my first job and I saved money for my, um, for my games. Um, went to university, got a degree in fine art, loved every second of it. Thought, crap, I need, I need to make some money. I can either go into teaching or go for it full time as an artist. I did neither. I, <laughs> I got a job with a friend's dad as a roofer. So I was laboring for about a year. Uh, I loved it in the summer in the, you could you could get a tan. You could be on top of the rooftops, you know, mending chimneys, re-roofing, retiling. It was good, wholesome work, and it broke me in like a, like a, like a horse because I was a lazy son of a what's it before then. Uh, and manual labour was the best thing that ever happened to me because it got me thinking, oh crap, this is really what the world's all about. I need to pull my socks up and get on with it. So I did that. Uh, I. Then at some point I realized I need to get back into the world of creativity and make some money. So I got my first Mac, which was an LC3. Um, it's one of those long, thin ones with a 14 inch screen. Um, and it had about 50 megabyte of RAM. And I remember doing a, a friend's logo on it and it kept crashing, it was around my house. In, in my front room and it kept crashing. I was going, oh, sorry, it's just a new machine. It's not me, it's the machine. And then the next year I got the, my first iMac, which was the, for generate, the first generation iMac, 96, I think, or 97, something like that. And it was like- 98. 98, no, it was before then, I'm sure it was before then. Was it really 98? I, I'm, I would die on this hill. <laughs> Nobody Wikipedia it, that's fine, I said it. It's 98. Nobody needs to look 98. that up. <laughs> 98. Um, and I've got Illustrator, After Effects and Photoshop on it. Um, and it opened up a whole world of joy. And I used to do, I was working at the time in uh, Virgin Megastore in Manchester, a side hustle of doing some graphic design jobs. Used to take every um, opportunity to work for free during my holiday during my um, vacation period in design agencies, just seeing how things work, copying what experienced designers, uh, emotion designers do, trying to pick up hints and tips and all that kind of thing. Um, and then fortuitously got my first sort of motion design role at Manchester United's television channel, which was the first year they'd set up um, before we were called motion designers. It was broadcast designers before the term motion designers were, was even a thing. And so I was doing a combination of live graphics play out and motion design for the shows that they broadcast before and after games. And it's brilliant, loved it. Moved on to uh, another a Polish 
broadcast company in Kent in the south of England. For two years there, before we all got made redundant, I was young enough to think, well, hey, I've got a bunch of money. I'm going to buy my first car. And then got a job straight away. It didn't bother me at all. Um, moved on to the DVD industry for Technicolor, Technicolor Creative Services as a motion designer. Worked my way up to senior motion designer within four years there. Left to start a management role at QVC. So I was managing motion graphic designers and live, gra live graphic player operators at QVC. Did that for 14 years. Um, loved it, hated it. The commute almost killed me. Um, and the opportunity to leave came last year. Uh, and I stepped out into the real world. And I thought, wow, what is this place? This is reality, is it? I'm no longer in corporate. A oh, crap. I need to do something about this. But yeah, so that was the learning curve for me was I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, which is sell, promote product services, uh, events, using motion graphics on social media. Because the last sort of in the last sort of six, five, six years at QVC, the, the digital team were um, sort of level pegging with the broadcast team in terms of sales. And by now they're probably gone like that. So sales digitally were going up and up and up. So I could see the potential of social um, as a platform for motion graphics. And so when I left, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I just had no clue about how to go about marketing myself. How do I set myself up as a business? All the basics, you know, do I, am I a sole trader? Do I go limited? Had no idea, had no idea. So I had to just ask, reach out, get all that kind of, um, real world basic advice and then I put myself on Haley's Motion Hatch Mastermind so she runs the Masterminds I think two or three times a year and I think I did that in May to the end of June last year and it's the best thing that I ever did because if you want if you have a personal goal or a business goal or any kind of goal um, that you're not sure how to develop, the mastermind is the best place for you. If you can afford, if you can afford it, the money and the time is the best place for you. Um, so the, the things I wanted to sort out were my branding. You know, I didn't have a logo. I didn't, I knew, I knew I had to market myself. But I need a logo. I need a, a visual language. Um, I need a set of basic guidelines. So over that time, I, I nailed that. I sorted out a website, which is rubbish, which is actually crap, by the way. Um, I'm having a landing page built now by a professional uh, web designer. Um, and it gave me a structure for how I needed to start promoting myself on LinkedIn. And at the time, I was thinking Instagram as well. Um, so I came off that with a real sort of clear plan. And essentially, I'm still I'm I'm still sort of sticking to it, and it's great. And the guys that were in my group, uh, we still meet up like this once a month for support, guidance, accountability. Outside of the outside of that mastermind, it's it's, it's brilliant. If you're thinking about it, and stick yourself on it if you can, it's great. And I also did her client quest course as well, which was um, very valuable. So. I'm adamant that, you know, my brain is like a sponge. I'm still there where I'm getting as much sort of advice, support and guidance as I can with marketing myself, um, looking at my package as a whole, how to sell, how to sell motion graphics as a package because I was adamant that I didn't want to be working for an agency because I had um, relatively negative experiences of agencies so i didn't want to go down that route although they're still in my back pocket i'm not going to say no i believe you should have your fingers in lots of pies if you can but i've got the opportunity now to, to really sort of promote me as a business and my package of motion design um offerings if you like to businesses through linkedin um and that's where i am that's my story in a nutshell 
Is that acceptable, George? It's it was acceptable without a doubt. <laughs> um, what's this masterclass you speak of? How much does it cost? Firstly, um, it was it's run it's run by Haley Aikens uh, Motion Hatch. It's called the Mastermind, and I think at the time it was about eight hundred pound for a nine week course. But you can split the cost up over three months, and it, I think I think she's done the same again. She runs it two or three Where times. Where would you yeah. be in life if you hadn't have taken that course? Um, I would be without the support of a very good group of friends that I've made. I'd be without the knowledge of how to step forward in in the big bad world as a business owner, which I see myself as a business owner rather than a freelancer. I think there's two important distinctions, nothing wrong with a freelancer, but I would prefer to see myself as a, as a business owner. Um, and what else would I say it's given me? It's given me confidence, it gave me a lot of confidence because a lot of people are in the same boat. A lot of people yeah. don't know what to do, don't know how to achieve personally or professionally with motion graphics. Well, there so was a discussion going on on uh, the School of Motion Facebook group of whether you should market yourself as a individual uh -huh. or market yourself as a company, uh -huh. you know, a, a limited company or LTV or individual. And uh, Liam was actually tagged in that post. So Liam? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, not to regurgitate exactly what I wrote, but kind of depends on where you are with your career and a little bit like regionality I've experienced too. Cause my quick background is I was a graphic designer for a number of years and did it just under my name. And I found that there was never pushback from clients when trying to get work. They're just like, all right, whatever. And then when I went to motion design, particularly where I live with local studios, they really wanted me to be a registered entity of some sort, either an LLC or whatever. I didn't really care about the name, but just that I was an LLC. So I decided to go down the route with a name instead of using my name. And after that, I stopped getting pushback. And so that was my general comment. The only double-sided sword of it is it's great for direct to clients, you know, that they're less apprehensive to work with you because you're registered and you're doing business as a business on the flip side is not so much agencies like marketing agencies but studios that specialize in motion design say like buck or giant ant or the mill or like these bigger name motion design studios are quite hesitant to work with somebody that isn't just working as their own name um because they're worried that they're gonna outsource to you and then you're gonna outsource it again and so on and so forth. And it's definitely a conversation I've had multiple times trying to, I guess, uh, calm people down from the fact that like, if you want to uh, hire me for a particular part in a project, then you're going to hire me. Like that, that's totally fine. Or if you want to just pass it through and you want to be a producer on the role, then that's totally fine too. And I can hire a team. It, it's really either way. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a concern for certain studios and agencies. Um, but I do like the idea of separating personal income and all those assets from my business income. It makes it a lot easier when doing finances. So it just kind of depends on where you're at in your career and what your goals are. Um, Augustine, I know you've been waiting for a while, so I want to jump to your question. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. My question is way less philosophical and it's more down to earth than the one from George. Um, so yeah, regarding the way, I mean, the people or the way you target things on LinkedIn, I was just curious if your connections are all like point to point, it's just talking to people or do you use the job boards also to like connect? Because my experience is Again, from my point of my my side in Belgium and everything, is that like the job boards never gave me anything good. I mean, 
there's certainly there's a lot of like jobs in there, but I mean, most of them, they don't reply or otherwise they are requesting impossible. Like, I mean, I don't know, you, 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 you have to be 25 and have the experience of an 80 years old seasoned person, which just doesn't make sense either. Yeah. And, and the very few of them um, who are kind of interesting are, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't work. And, and so I was curious if you combine both or if you work by, you know, like warming a lead first, like interacting with the, their posts and stuff. And then you end up like, I don't know, just reaching out for something. Um, and I was curious if, if that's the case, for what exactly do you reach out? You know, it's like, because I mean, reaching out for me, like, hey, uh, are you looking for somebody? <laughs> I'm just resuming like very roughly, but I mean, feels kind of awkward. Yeah. So it's how, how I mean, yeah, when you reach out is what's the, the hook, you know, what's, what are you reach, which, reaching out for? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And it's, it, there's no real black and white simple answer to that. But I've figured a few, a couple of processes that work. First of all, people say you need to warm leads up. So first of all, you, you rather than connect, you can, you can have the option to follow someone, which means they don't, know that you've connected but you can follow everything they post I, I just see that as a bit of a waste waste of time if you know the people you want to connect with because they're either your peers or there's somebody you want to work with or potential leads go connect with them if you can um, if they accept that connection request then at that point I may look at their profile and see what the latest couple of posts are that they've done and if they are interesting and I can offer something of interest over so cool or love this or wow which is just rubbish you might is you're doing yourself more harm than if, if if you're actually writing that kind of crap you know it's just like nonsense but if you can offer something interesting or relatable then do it um, and then what I normally do is DM them. Uh, and if I really want to work with them, I will, I will not go in hard. I will say uh, something along the lines of, um, I'm looking to increase my connections with people in your sector. Would you be interested in what I offer? Here's a link to a couple of examples that I've done, which link to your posts that you might have posted last week or the week before of some work that you did for another client. If you'd like to chat this through, DM me and I'll sort of, I'll arrange a, a Zoom. Keep it simple like that. Informal, simple. Um, if they ignore you, I then follow that up a few days later. And if they ignore that, then I forget about them. But you never know who's watching because my best clients I've had are people that have reached out to me and said, I've been watching you. <laughs> they both said, I've been watching you. Like really creepy. I call them linky lurkers. Um, they don't engage. They just watch. And here's the thing. Here's a really, really interesting stat. 1% of all people on LinkedIn make content. 1% of people. Let's think of the millions that are on LinkedIn. 1% of, um, make the content, which was shocking. It shocked me. But then if I kind of turn that around to the people that said, I'm watching you, that kind of makes sense because most people watch me rather than engage on my post. So if I don't get much engagement, I don't care for vanity, uh, vanity views or figures anymore because I know people are watching. Um, you can see the amount of views that you've had. Sometimes they're rubbish, sometimes they're okay, but it doesn't matter because people are watching. <laughs> um, so to kind of answer that question, connect, engage on a post, and then DM with yeah. uh, an example of what you've done. And on a side question, really short, is how much of your time does this take 
I, I, I'm not going to ask per day, but I mean, like per week or per day. I don't know how you measure this because yeah, yeah. I, I know I know that you have to work in the business and on the business. You know, mm -hmm. like there's those both sides of things. I'm completely aware of it. Um, yeah, I was just curious how yeah. much this consumes of your time. Well, when I first started doing this, um, before I'd honed down the process, it was like, I'd look at the clock and three hours had gone by. I was like, oh crap, I've got to get this work done. I've been, I've been like on LinkedIn for the last three hours trying to connect. But the more you do it, the more you hone it down. So I would say about half an hour a day connecting. Um, what did I say? Connecting, engaging and DMing, even if it's two or three people. Because you can spend all day doing it. You could easily spend all day doing it. Um, so it keeps half an hour a day. It, it's enough. I was going to ask while we're on the same topic, do you think LinkedIn Pro is worth it for everybody to, to track all this stuff? I spent £25 a month on LinkedIn Premium for my first sort of three to four months on it. Everyone I spoke to that had been on it for a long time and were doing really well on it said it's not worth it. Um, and I can, I'd agree with them. I also, it's, it's worth doing the free, you have a one month free trial and you can also have, I think a one month free trial of sales tracker, which basically is a more in-depth search engine for the companies that you're interested in. It, when the work, I haven't got work because I had the premium version, put it that way. So I would say it's, no, is the answer to that question. Don't worry about it. Yeah, because I've done it a couple of times when I've had those free months renew. I'm like, all right, this is kind of interesting. I can see some more stats that I haven't seen before, but it doesn't seem to make a difference really. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can I yeah. state the opposite? Oh, really, um, George? <laughs> for once. I just want to say that I've dabbled with LinkedIn Pro. They got me with a free trial. And, and I, the, the, the value I got from LinkedIn Pro was being able to DM people I didn't know. I saw a post from them saying, hey, we're looking for someone. And then even though because I wasn't connected to them, I could get directly to their DMs and I got a job that way. Only once, and that was the the whole value of LinkedIn Pro for me, was I could DM people that I wasn't connected to. That's all I wrote. So those people, I guess, has that turned into anything for you, being able to DM people that you're not connected to? Because for me, I just kind of go through the motion of, I see somebody in my feed that seems to be popping up a lot or is interesting or have commented on, I'll go to their profile and then I'll add them and I might shoot them a message be like, hey, I really like what you've been sharing. I've seen it pop up a few times. I just want to connect with you. And then that's it. But for DMing, that leaves out the connection part, right? So does that seem worth it? I, I don't know. The, the way I view it is, if someone's posting on LinkedIn, they're not desperate, but they need someone to fill that role and they want to get that role filled as quick as possible. If I can skip the queue of having to connect with them and, and DM them straight away, say, hey, I can do this. I'm here right now. It's, it's, yeah, it's jumping one step and it's kind of worth it if you don't have anything else to do at the time. All right. Um, well, we're almost at the top of the hour. I was going to really quickly see if anyone else had anything that they wanted to throw out there before we wrap it up. Um, I think I got everyone from the chat. I'm just going to scroll through really quick. Uh, George, if you haven't been keeping an eye on the chat, Augustine is complimenting you left and right. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to read the chat for the first time ever. Well, can I ask something? Did you say, can you ask something? Can I ask something? Do oh, I have to write in the chat? Or can I, um, this is unorthodox, yeah. but we'll, we'll allow it. It's going off-piste. What's he doing? 
Um, has anyone, does, it, does everyone, does anyone post consistently on LinkedIn? No, and I, I'm gonna be honest, I am, I have your post feed up right now and I'm trying to take notes <laughs> of what you're doing and figure out like how I can replicate some of it. Consistently one. No. Uh-oh, lucky you froze there for a second. You got like two words out and then I cut out. Yeah, consistently once a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, uh, the, the burden with all these posting things again, and but that's, that's my my um, like problem with it. It's like psychologically, I'm kind of against having to methodically post because the, the algor there's an algorithm like pushing you to do it. There's a part of me that I have to fight. I'm trying to, but like I'm re I really have to fight it because I'm like, why cannot we post more, you know, like unevenly and get the same traction? So you have to be like active all the time, but then you have to be thinking of what you post all the time. And this is kind of like extra hustle or extra mind work that you could like certainly target to something way more useful to my point of view. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, family, kids, uh, yourself, uh, other work, other business stuff, talking to more people like networking. But no, you have to be posting. And that's what I was saying earlier with this whole like inspirational quotes and everything. It feels sometimes a lot of this like, I'm trying to fill the void to stay relevant in this kind of algorithm thing. And that's the part that I hate, but it's not only LinkedIn, it's also Instagram or mm -hmm. whatever. And I would like, but that's my personal wish. I would love, I would love that would, that would change. And I would hope like that LinkedIn, since it's a professional network and it's not like influencer place per se, I would expect that from LinkedIn, but it's not the case. I think LinkedIn is influencer space, but influencer in terms of like big name pol posters that make like, oh, look at us. We're so amazing because of this massive thing. Like that's the big, like the, the thing that I always see on LinkedIn is just like a huge company name and then some random CEO going, I'm so amazing because back when I was a teenager, I didn't think this person could ever get this job. But now that I've learned to control, like this, this like massive story, like, like it's all like, everything's just like, everyone's just commenting on like one post or five posts and there's thousands of comments. It's very like organized into like low posts, at least from what I see. See, maybe Bart can answer this too or has experience with it. I have found the more that I've gone on LinkedIn in the last year, the less of that crap that I see and the more I see of actual people in my network updating and it's bypassing those bigger players. So like if you're following Bill Gates, for example, and you see a bunch of people commenting on his post and it keeps showing up, up again and again, you, you'll probably see that if you're going less frequently, but if you hit it once a day or like every other day, I start to see like Jen from this company who I haven't seen post in a while. And I go to her profile and see like, oh, she's been posting like every other day. And then she starts to show up a little bit more. Or I see Tom from this other company and he's starting to show up more. And it's like, okay, now I'm starting to see this other crap filter out. So I think it's a... It's both sides. If you're not using it frequently, you're going to get only hit with the biggest players. But if you're using it frequently, then you're going to get hit with actual people in your network. Do you find that that's, to be true, Mark? That's a really important point, actually. Um, I don't think anyone really knows how um, posts end up in your feed. I get if I, if I view my feed on my app, on my phone, I'll get a different feed to if I'm viewing it on desktop. Uh, and it's really weird if I respond to something on my app and I'll see that response three hours later on that same feed on desktop. It's a really bizarre experience. So I don't really know how it, how it works, but certainly I think, um, you know, the, the, there's a few sort of LinkedIn experts that I respect because they are very authentic and they're not corporate. And in fact, there's one rather than a few. Um, and she is always saying three times a week is fine if you've got something um, meaningful, interesting, or funny to say. 
people like to laugh, people like to think about things, and people like to um, engage. Uh, you know, and it, if there's a story about yourself that's vaguely related to what you do, then that's just as interesting. So, you know, if you think you're not being prolific enough by posting two or three times a week, then the expert says that you're wrong, go for it. Just, just go for it, talk about what you do. You know, I've, I've followed guys now that have just started out and they are talking about, this is their first time on LinkedIn. This is what I do. I'm just reaching out to create a new network. Um, they are the guys that get good engagement because they're honest. They're not anyone else. They're, they're being themselves. They're, they're saying, I'm new here. <laughs> Hi, everyone, I'm new here. Basically, like walking to a party and you don't know anyone. That's what it is. You're saying, Hi, I'm new here. Would anyone like to um, sort of reach out and, and have a chat? And that's it. And they, if you write a little bit about your story, then they, those guys are going to get decent engagement and because of their honesty. Uh, Jens, what's up, dude? I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And thank for, for being on the show. And nice to meet you, Mark. Um, Thank you very much. My, my question was just that um, I would say I like LinkedIn a lot. I would say to the talk that I had before, I agree about that. That I actually think the the thing I see the thing that I have against LinkedIn, as it sounds like, actually I see as a positive thing as the other people are saying because because it used to be that platform where all the business people say about how good we're sold and the prices are get, that mean it's easier to make a contrast when you're suddenly giving something. Because this is not that where I feel like on Instagram, you just be part of a big stream, but it's just floating and it's so hard to just be heard. And I feel like an Instagram is not necessary where the people is for job search things. So I like to be able to cut a line to have my Instagram for creativity, but get inspired and Instagram for things, business-wise things, where I do something or show something. Uh, so I actually think there's a positive thing about it. Uh, and, and, it and I agree about that my experience with LinkedIn is more than I am um, on it. It's like the time you invest in it, the more the feed will be customized and personalized like you do on Instagram. I guess that if you didn't do anything on Instagram about who you follow and that so forward, forward, it would be crappy as well, right? Oh, sorry, it, uh, that was not me. Um, the question to you, Mark, was just that um, uh, I'm very nervous about posting too much things. I feel like, is there, what is your experience about the border of if how much you post? Have you got any any um, data out of if you post so much, then this happened, and if you post that much, then that happened uh, in some rating where you maybe lose some kind of people or not? I know myself, I feel like, encouraged to unfollow people when they're posting once a day, for example, right? And I guess it depends on what kind of people you want to attract, right? What is your experience uh -huh. when it comes to that? Uh -huh. Well, I tend to, I, I generally sort of post once a day. Um, today I posted twice a day because I, I did like a, a, a general salesy post in the morning, then I did a promotional post for this meetup. Um, this evening um, but normally I, I post once a day maybe once every other day but that's that's enough if you want to post more then I, the algorithm is going to be very happy with you <laughs> um, but I would say don't be a slave to the algorithm if you genuinely want to genuinely want to post then then do it mm. um, people love you don't have to talk about what you do all the time like I said before I, I do a couple of, maybe one family post um, a week, a, a weekend. I sort of stick the salesy post between Monday to Thursday um, and a jokey post if, if, if I can on a Friday. If, if I can't think, if I genuinely can't think of anything I'm short of ideas, then I'll just leave it. If I'm over brimming with ideas, then I'll go for it. Or I'll just write stuff down and I'll think, well, I can do that one that day, that one that day, and then that one that day. Uh, and I've got, I've got a very basic, simple, visual language that I've developed, which is 
um, a line drawing over a, a rough textured background that I can use very easily to illustrate um, what I write about. Um, and that served me quite well because to do a motion design piece every day just for LinkedIn is you'd be dead within six months of starting out. So develop a, a, a simple, quick visual style that that would help um, illustrate what you're writing about. If you don't, if you don't have like a, a professional piece that you can post that is based on client work, develop your own visual style. It might be something that you're working on personally. I'm going to, I know that I'm going to transition from that very basic line drawing to a collage Terry Gilliam-esque style in the next sort of few months because you know, I love collage and I need to, I want to sort of start introducing that kind of style to my, my posts as a way of illustrating what I'm writing about. Um, but if you yes. want to post two or three times a day, then as, as long as you're adding value to use a phrase or being interesting or responding to something or, and it's not just a unicorn quote, like, you got this. Yeah. Hello, Monday. You've got this. All that kind of nonsense. Yeah. You Can make a follow-up uh, question to that, Liam? Um, I mean, I don't really have the energy to do that because I have three kids. <laughs> so no, no, no. Now I just can I ask a follow-up follow-up question to Lawrence. Oh, to I what? thought you said, did I have a follow-up? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. 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 Yeah. No. Okay, um, you, can, you can totally yeah. ask a follow-up. Um, I just going to say really quick too. Um, while we're on the topic, if you're having trouble thinking of ideas, Haley from Motion Hatch with yeah. Ben Marriott put out a like posting calendar, which I just drop in the chat to give yourself some ideas of uh, what you can post. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but the question was just to talk about that. I have like made like a social plan as well um, about what kind of things I post. So this thing about when you're posting once a day or two times a day, do you have an do you in without thinking about it even might have an idea about what kind of posts you think so it's not too much the example i feel like sometimes i see people with the post like long list almost like it shouldn't be a post things every day and then mm -hmm. just okay this person just posts crazy things mm -hmm. i feel like there could be some people have a dynamic and it's purposeful have a dynamic so one day is a short thing longer and then you don't feel like you get too much do you have something like that as well, Lawrence, that you do on purpose? Um, I'd like to say that I'm really, really organized. And I, it'd be nice to say I, I, I plan my week a week in advance. Yeah. <laughs> but um, generally, it is um, sort of on the day or the day before I think, um, oh, I can post about this, oh, I can post about that. I really struggle with writing decent copy. I really, really struggle with writing copy so I, I i made a point of following some really really shit hot copywriters that i really really like um and there's one guy on instagram that i follow called lewis dalton he's a brilliant no bs copywriter i follow james lorraine he's a us based copywriter i, can't, I don't know where he's from i want to say seattle but he's brilliant. He post, He's prolific. He posts every day. Um, and I did a uh, collaboration with him, actually. So good inspirations. It's, yeah, it's the, what, those copyright. Those copywriters are, are, are amazing. What they can, what they can write, the, the the clarity in which they write, the you know the, the emotions that can be stirred through copy. It's just, I I kind of envy that. <laughs> So I don't say I copy them, but I take inspiration from the, the process that they that they have. They, you know, as we do, we create a visual hook. They create a hook at the top of their copy with a kind of clickbaity first first line that gets you in. Mm. Uh, and then they kind of hit you with the, the value sort of further down. Pretty much what we do, but, you know, they do that in copy. And I really envy that. So um, following copyrights has helped me to think better about what I write about and how I write about it. But I don't plan because I don't have time to plan. <laughs> it just comes, I have to fit it around my day. 
So if I got well, then I think you do pretty good, Mark. Well, I appreciate that. I really yeah. appreciate that. And thank, thank for the answer, Mark. Thank okay. you. But I wasn't always. I've, I've changed. The, the, like I said, when I first started out, I started like seven months ago. I started writing like I was um, in corporate, writing an email to my team, and it bombed. Everything bombed until I started reaching out to people and getting advice. So copywriters are great people to, copywriters that you admire, you have to admire them. You can't just be anyone. They're people you have to admire. Um, you know, follow them, connect with them, see how they do it. Um, I, you know, I used to write essays and now I've cut down a lot of um, unnecessary unnecessary copy from my copy if you like i'm kind of unlearning the english language for social media <laughs> it's really weird my english teacher would would hate me i think i'm going to do one more thank question because i don't want to hold your time too long mark um, thank you so i travis just wrote in the chat he's wondering what kind of return have you had on all your activity um does it has it led to a lot of work which Thing we've determined it has but how about like returning clients are you going direct to client or are you working with studios um so yeah i guess what kind of return of investment have you gotten from this um it's my first year of trading so i it's not i'm able to live put it that way it's not um i can see how it works in terms of uh, making a decent living from direct clients on LinkedIn. So, but I'm playing the long game because it's content, essentially it's content marketing. You're talking about yourself. It's, what is the, is it inbound marketing? It's inbound yeah. when you're, you make content and people come to you, it's inbound. And if you go direct to someone, as in a cold email, that's outbound. Have I got that right? Yeah, I think so. As far as I know, I think so. That's yeah. what Chris says. So I do. Oh, Jeff says, yeah, thanks, Jeff. I do, um, I do more inbound stuff than outbound. And I think I need to balance the two to get, to get that right. But um, it's not where I want it to be at the moment, but because it's the long game, content marketing, but I can see how it would really work out. Yeah. Um, but you have to, you do have to invest the time. Um, and you change as, as, the more you post, the more you find your style, the more you find your feet. You have to do trial and error, and it's it's a long game over, over several months. Yeah. Um, yeah, I find that to be true, too. And I've told people, like, your first year freelancing, it's pretty horrible. Like, you can live, but it's definitely not what you imagined it would be. And it just, like, you can see that hill of income, and then, like, each year just gets a little bit better and better um so george i'm not gonna hold you to this because your computer was in a fish tank but do you have a meme this week i am so I surprised you were able to get a meme done Oh, I didn't make this. I uh, was on, I don't know if you heard this site called Reddit. Well, anyway, I was on Reddit and I saw this meme and I thought, that's so good. I don't have to make a meme today. So let me explain why it's funny. You can see my screen, right? Uh, so we've all been in this situation when you're Googling for maybe a logo of the company you're working for. <laughs> and, you know, you're on Google image, image search and you're looking for the transparent PNG. But then there's these sons of guns. I'm choosing my language very carefully. These sons of guns who make these fake PNGs. There must be people who put transparent PNGs onto the checkerboard background to fool all of us when we're in a hurry looking for transparent PNG, PNGs to meet the deadline. So that is why this is me. I have to say, I've never had that happen to me, but I've what? heard about it more times. I've fallen foul. I've fallen foul. Yeah. Man. 
Yeah. But you get it into Photoshop and and it's like, what? what? <laughs> it says P it says transparent. I, I I'm gonna fall prey to it now. I'm gonna have to knock on wood multiple times. It's gonna happen. Um, well, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to say, Mark, thank you so much for chatting with us and sharing your background and um, giving us feedback on what you're doing to Thanks market for yourself on LinkedIn. Me. Yeah, I don't think there's enough resources for motion designers about LinkedIn, so uh, it's very helpful. Yeah, um, anyone, anyone that wants to know any more, give me a shout, hit me up, DM, get in touch, whatever. I'll yeah, show what I was going to say, uh, did you want to plug your... I guess website or what's best LinkedIn how, how should people get a hold of you just LinkedIn um, I've got a website it's marklawrence.co.uk it's not great uh, I'm having a landing page built of my offer soon um, but if you want to get in touch just find me on LinkedIn fantastic um, and for listeners of the recording you can find notes and everything through mondaymeeting.org and just search social media for Monday meeting. We're all over the place. Um, but yeah, everybody have a great week. And thanks for everybody that tuned in today, seeing as the day after Easter did not take that into account, but it turned out to be good chat. So that's great. I hope everyone has a great week. So we'll see you all later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, guys. Bye. All right. All right. Stop the recording.